I close the eyes to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this planning meeting. Thank you for your leaders, for your servants, for your children. Thank you because you have called us so as to impart something into our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, that the impartation will be very definite in this planning meeting in Jesus' name. And you lift up higher in ministry. Lead us, Lord, in the way we ought to go. And as we follow the pathway of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray, we'll be like you, succeed like you, minister like you, and draw multitudes in the kingdom of God through your name and your power, your spirit, your wisdom in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. Please be seated. In our planning meeting at this time, we are following through our series in the presentation of the word of God and it's still going to be on leadership. Actually we are going to take a series on the biblical pictures of leadership and we'll consider the leader as a shepherd, as a servant, as a steward, as a strategist, as a seeker, as a seer, as a spokesman and as a sustainer. And when we finish uh, the planning meeting here. We're going to have the planning meeting in every state and in every nation of Africa so that those who are not able to come here will be able to benefit. And in all these sessions I'll be taking, there is a chorus we are going to be singing. I'll be varying it as the time goes on. You might see the reason why. And you, we all know it. Or oh, you don't clap your hands. You just sing it with me. I give you the words and you sing. Keep me true, Lord Jesus. Keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus. Keep me true. Everybody sing. Keep me true, Lord Jesus. Keep me true. There's a race I must run. There is a victory to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. Keep me strong. Keep me strong. Lord Jesus, keep me strong. Keep me strong. Lord Jesus, keep me strong. There's a race I must run. There's a victory to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. Keep me firm. Keep me firm. Lord Jesus, keep me firm. Keep me firm, Lord Jesus, keep me firm. There is a race I must run. There is a victory to be won. Give me power every hour to be firm. Keep me true, keep me true. Lord Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There is a race I must run, and there is a victory to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. Amen. In Numbers chapter 27, I'm reading from verse 16 and verse 17. Numbers chapter 27, verse 16. Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation that may go out before them and which may come in, go in before them and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not a sheep 
was no shepherd, which had no shepherd. Here the Lord is giving us the picture of a leader. Because it says, this is going to be a leader that will lead them out, that will lead them in, bring them in. Will lead them out to service. And then bring them in for their sustenance. And he calls the leader a shepherd. So the Lord is giving us here a picture of the shepherd. We're going to be considering some practical issues on leadership. And we intend to develop this in such a way that we'll be able to grow in our leadership skills. The sessions we're going to be having will not be theoretical. They'll be practical. When we give messages, there are messages that give us, number one, information. And you listen to a preacher. He has not wasted your time. He has given you some information. You listen to some other preachers and they give you not only information, they give you instruction. You look at the things that have been said and you have learned something. You have been taught something. You have got some instruction. But we thank God for some other leaders. As they go into the word of God, they don't only read the Bible. They interpret the Bible to us and they give us interpretation. And some of the passages of scripture that you didn't understand before just becomes clear to you. And you are enlightened. You are instructed. And now you will say, I'm not following fables because I know the proper interpretation of that word. But then some other preachers go ahead and they give us illumination. Now then you can see the light has been thrown upon your own life. And the such light of the word of God kind of enlightens you, illumines you as to your condition. And that's what God did for Isaiah. When the illumination came, he saw who God was, he saw who he was, and he saw the ministry ahead of him. And then number five is inspiration. There are some messages that give you inspiration. And then number six is impartation. Some messages just impart some good virtues into our lives. Sometimes we'll find that when we preach, we just concentrate on one of these. And it's a very rare occasion when you find the preachers that don't only really give you impartation and inspiration, but you go from the very beginning and you have information while you are looking at uh, the Word of God and you are sharing the Word of God together. And you are getting some instructions too, as well as interpretation of the Word of God, as well as illumination, inspiration, and the impartation. We are believing the Lord that during this time, the purpose of our coming to this planning meeting will be fulfilled. That we will have personal growth and greater effectiveness in ministry. Already you see that the picture we are looking at today is a picture of the shepherd. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock. Immediately you mention the flock, you are thinking about the sheep. As you are thinking about the sheep, you are also thinking about their shepherd. And so the people, the leaders, the elders that Paul the Apostle was addressing here can be referred to as shepherds over the flock of God. Take it, therefore, unto yourselves. Take care of yourself. Develop yourself. Build yourself up. Get more knowledge of the watch of the Lord and get more knowledge of the peculiarities of the sheep in particular that you are leading and then take it to all the flock. When it says all the flock, it means virtually every, every sheep and every section of the flock. And as you think about our ministries, we're thinking about ourselves as overseers, overseers over the whole church of God in a locality. But as we think about the people in our locality, as we think about the sheep, they are not all having the same ministry. Some of them are men, some of them are women, some of them are youth, some of them are children, some of them are language people, and some of them are educated people. And some of them are new converts, and some of them are older converts. Some of them have some great responsibilities. Some of them are just waiting for responsibilities to be given to them. And as you think about every section of the flock, and you want to take care, you want to give heed, you want to take heed to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. That's the ministry of the shepherd. is feeding, is guiding, is supplying, 
their needs and is doing for them what will make them have a satisfied life in the lord which uh, the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood as we continue with uh, the leadership series uh, you will not just be writing the notes of what i say you'll be writing notes also on the various areas of the flock and as we mention something, then you're thinking about, oh yes, that uh, the men, the men in the fellowship, am I taking care of them in particular? The women in the fellowship, am I developing them to their full potential? And the children section, as a shepherd, have I ever been to those lands, to those young ones? Have I gone to encourage them? How about the youth section? Have I contributed to the growth, spiritual growth of the youth section? And how about the language area? Do I despise them? That's part of my flock. And if this is the flock, and we're going to take care, we're going to give you to all the sections of the flock, how we need to be thinking about them. And as we think about them, we're thinking of what have I done before that worked? That I need to do more of that. And then we say, what have I done before that didn't work? That didn't produce a good result, a positive result? What change do I need to make? Because I need to be flexible if I'm taking heed and taking care of the flock of God. It is that flexibility that makes me to then think about my ministry. I've done it this way before. It didn't work. And I went this direction before, it didn't work. And that doesn't discourage me at all. It just makes me to know I need to be flexible and take another route so I can still get to my destination. And so we're taking it to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made us overseers. I'm going to divide the message into three parts. Number one, the characteristics of a shepherd leader. The characteristic of the shepherd leader. You put an iPhone. That is a dash between the shepherd and the leader. Number two, the concern of the shepherd leader. The concern of the shepherd leader. And then number three, the courage of the shepherd leader. The courage of the shepherd leader. I come back to number one, the characteristics of the shepherd leader. The characteristics of the shepherd leader. Who is a shepherd? A shepherd is, number one, somebody that knows the way. Number two, somebody that shows the way. Then, number three, somebody that goes the way. If you're a shepherd, you must know the way. If you don't know the way, how are you going to lead those people in the direction they ought to go? If you know the way, you must show the way as a shepherd. And if you're showing the way, eh, there's some people that say, now that's the way sheep, that's the way flock, go there. And then they stay behind. You show the way and then you go the way with the people. We're looking at uh, Numbers chapter 27 again. Numbers chapter 27 in verse 16. Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, search a man over the congregation he has done that already now in your state he has made you the state overseer he has done that already in your region he has made you the region overseer he has done that already in the youth section he has made uh, you as the leader over the youth in that state in that region in that locality he's done that for the children already has placed a man he has placed a woman he has placed a leader he has placed a shepherd over the congregation of the lord then it now tells us what that shepherd is to do among the men among the women in the various sections what is he to do verse 17 which may go out before them the leader leads not from the rear but from the front the leader leads not from behind but he leads right in front as a leader you'll say right in front and then you know the way you show the way you go the way with the people you are going before them which may go in before them will lead them into the evangelistic field will lead them into the field of ministry and then when the field of ministry is over at that particular time we lead them back into the fellowship that means then as we are leading as well with well, the house fellowship system take our coordinators for example they are to show the way to to the district and they are to attend the house fellowship they are also to mobilize and motivate all these members, make them go out in evangelistic work, and then make them come back in, and come back in with them in edification. 
we're going out with them we're going out before them and we're coming in with them and we're coming in before them too and which may lead them out and which may bring them in you will see the intimacy you will see the interaction uh, between this shepherd and the sheep and that ought to be the case in our midst that if you're a shepherd and you are you ought to be very close to the flock and you ought to interact with them you ought to be intimate with them and you ought to be able to go before them if they will not know the way if they could not see you if you are running so far ahead that the distance between you just makes them not to see you or they see you far ahead and then when you have a bend and your turn they cannot see where you have gone slow down be patient go along with them and as you go along with them and they go along with you then you'll be leading them out You'll be leading them in. And sometimes it happens with little children. We're guiding the children. We're helping the children to know the way. You show the way, you, show, you know the way, and you go the way. And then we're so fast because we're adults. Our knowledge, our understanding, and our skill, and everything, the vision we have got, we're only so far ahead of those children, they cannot catch up. Or it is uh, those who are ministering with the youth, uh, they are running so fast and they're speaking so high, and all the things they say because of their present knowledge, they go so far, and the young people, the youth, cannot catch up with them. Or it is uh, some men who go into women's meetings, and you have to go once in a while and help them too. But we don't understand that they reason differently from the way we reason. And we go so far and we talk so high and our illustrations and things are so far away that they do not, they cannot relate with what we are saying. So why don't you come down? Why don't you become more patient and go so slowly that the people will be able to catch up with you? That the congregation of the Lord be not a sheep which have no shepherd. Uh, the Lord wants us to understand that as we lead, this is what we are to do. We are leading the people to pasture. And when God called David, he called him to be a shepherd over the people of God. In Psalm 78, Psalm 78, reading from verse 70, he chose David also, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the youth, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel in his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. Now, as we look at the uh, shepherds, what can we say about them, about their characteristics? I use the letters V, I, P. And isn't he, isn't the shepherd a VIP in the congregation? But for V, I mean vision. For V, uh, for V, I mean vitality. A leader must have vision. A shepherd must have vision. A shepherd must be able to look ahead and he can see beyond where the pasture is. He can see beyond you where the dangers are. And because he sees before the people, he's able to go ahead of them. And he must have vitality. He must have vitality. He must be fresh every time. Fresh every time. And that chorus we sang will come to the other side when we're going to say, Keep me fresh, Lord. Keep me fresh. There's a race to be run. And there's a victory to be won. Keep me fresh every hour, Lord. Keep me fresh. Because it is as you have that vision and vitality then you'll be able to keep on standing and keep on preaching and keep on leading and keep on guiding guiding the people of god v for vision and vitality that that is talking about our intellectual qualities and as you think about the areas of ministry it's talking about mission related skills there are some skills we need to develop in our leadership and those leadership are related with our mission, our ministry, our dream, our goal, our objective, the places, the place we ought to go. And as you look at David, David had a vision. And he took the uh, people of Israel from the place where Saul left them. And he left them, he led them forward. I is for involvement and interaction. Involvement and interaction. Here we have read about David. He was a leader that got involved with the people. 
and this will develop our social qualities or social characteristics this is people related skill people related skills you see there are some leaders their knowledge they, they develop their knowledge related skills when it comes to interpreting the bible preaching the word of god they are marvelous and they are fantastic and terrific but when it comes to interacting with people getting involved with people and socializing with people and knowing the needs of the people staying where the people say, stay and relating with the people they have not developed the people skills and that is an area you need to develop in your leadership too and when you develop that social quality the people related skills you're going to get involved you get involved with the people now getting involved with the people is more than just showing up there are people that their presence uh, with the team of people actually will slow them down their presence of the people will convey an idea of fear and timidity because it's a big figure that has come and as it comes everybody's tracing treaties up and there's no one that is wanting to make a mistake and because they're afraid of the leadership i don't want to make any mistake in his presence then they become kind of rigid it's like you put them in a freezer and they cannot move all of a sudden their joints will have arthritis that will not allow anything to move and then in their mind they are saying i wish you would leave i wish you would go because his presence is making us not to operate the way we are to operate because there's no freedom and you know the reason why the reason is because although you are present with them you are not relating with them properly but you need to get involved and you need to interact with the people and your interaction your presence will free them up and if they're going to make mistakes they go they, they say i'm going to make my mistakes at this time when my leader is around because i have a chance of being corrected so v is for vision and vitality i is for involvement and interaction p for performance and persistence as you look at the ministry of david as a shepherd he performed he defeated those philistines and he persisted he continued and this is uh, relating to our personality qualities and he's talking about our effectiveness related skills v relates with intellectual quality mission related skills a, that, that i relates with social qualities people related skills and p that relates with our personality uh, qualities effectiveness related skills as we come to jeremiah chapter 23 jeremiah chapter 23 i'm reading from verses 3 and 4 and i will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither i have driven them and will bring them again to the to their foes and they shall be fruitful and increase our people are going to be fruitful the flock under our leadership will be fruitful and they will increase in jesus name and see the kind of shepherds is going to search over the people of god and i will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them already you see two parts there i will set up shepherds over them that he has done already and we need to be grateful to god for what he has done why we're then looking at the purpose for which he did what he did he has placed you there you are the shepherd and he has set the shepherds over the people of god the thing now to discover is why am i here what am i supposed to do and why has he placed me over the people of god and over this section of the work to feed them to feed them to feed them how many times we forget the reason for being how many times we forget the reason for being where we are to feed them and what do you think of a mother who has um, hungry children and uh, the purpose and the plan and the duty is to feed the children at that time then as the uh, mother came into the room and saw that there were some things that were not well arranged in the room and he saw that uh, she saw that the table is not where it ought to be the shears who climbed on this chair and then the mother now dropped the food in her hand and said children get up everybody and everybody is hungry and the best thing and the only thing we ought to do now is just to feed 
and when we are fed then we can take care of all the other things but the mother feels that i like orderliness and cleanliness and so that is what everybody must do now I haven't at one time done that as leaders so many times that we the purpose of feeding the people we leave that aside and there are some insignificant things and some non-essentials and some things that really does not hurt ministry does not hurt anybody that are there they ought to be corrected if they can be corrected if they are not corrected we'll still be able to get to the kingdom of god and what we need now is to feed the people of god and yet we concentrate on those other things and we're not feeding them now when we say that we're not saying that we have failed in fact what you need to understand in the series where you know looking at now you may want to write this down number one there's a vision number two there is uh, there is a mission and number three there is a, there is a strategy that is a strategy to carry out the mission and then there is uh, going to be the action the action plan and then there's going to be the result now is the result i'm coming to now you know the vision you know what we're called to do you know the mission is clearly defined and then we have developed strategies that's what we did at the beginning of the year this is the vision before me this is the mission i'm going to carry out god helping me by the end of this year in my ministry in my section this ought to have been done this ought to have been done this ought to have been done and then you develop strategies how do i get there and then you begin to take some actions maybe you are taking those actions already now what if there is failure I want you to write the failure but cross out the failure write it but cross it out after you've written it i've got done that and then write feedback instead of that failure and when you have uh, gone through those actions and then you see that uh, there is failure cancel the failure and just say i'm getting a feedback here and the feedback i'm getting is that this method will not work the vision remains the same the mission remains the same but because the feedback I've got is not the feedback I want and it's not giving me success, I go back, I don't change the vision, I don't change the mission, I change the strategy. And then if I change the strategy and then I develop a new series of action plan and then I continue to do that, if it lands me on failure again, again I say, no, it's not failure. I'm just discovering ways in which this thing will not work and there's a man that is called thomas edison thomas edison actually was you know an inventor but when he was uh, very young uh, the teacher just gave him up we're coming to that uh, later you know the people that will give up they can never make it they can never do it they can never succeed uh, the uh, the teacher gave him up and sent, sent him back home this child cannot make it go back home but the mother took that child sat down with that child and trained that child educated that child home training and teaching him how to read how to spell how to put words together how to do things and eventually he became an inventor and was trying to invent uh, the electric bulb he did it and failed he did it again and failed he did it again and failed after he's done it done it hundreds of times some people even say thousands of times then some people asked him and you bothered that you have failed so many times he said no i didn't fail i discovered many ways in which not to invent an electric bulb it's giving me feedback not failure and that you need to discover in your life that all the things you have done and they didn't work you have not failed it's just giving you feedback it will not work go back to the strategy change the strategy and then after he has done some inventions at the age of 63 uh, Thomas Edison was, you know, meeting with some people, and here was his laboratory. Some of the wires touched, and some of the solutions, of course, maybe they mixed together inadvertently, and everything went up in flames. And uh, then Charles Edison, that's the son, was there, and Charles was bothered. And Charles, you know, ran to where the father was, and uh, you know, get to get him out of the car. Daddy, daddy, the laboratory is burning. Everything that he had ever invented, everything was burning down. And then he said, Charles, go and call your mother. That uh, she will never see something like this in her life. See how everything just brightens up the whole community. Go and call her. Go and call her before everything burns down. So that, you know, your mother will see something she will never see again. 
at the age of 63 when everything that he did everything was up in flames and yet he understood you don't give up a shepherd does not give up a leader does not give up and when it appears you have failed you start all over again and then for the next 18 19 years before he died because after that age of 63 he still spent another 18 or uh, 19 years before he died and made a lot of other inventions and that's what is going to happen to you it's like you are starting all over again and everything that you have done the lord will increase and multiply everything in jesus name here is a kind of leader god wants you to be that you will understand you are to feed the flock of god that they shall and they shall have no fear they shall fear no more nor be dismayed neither shall they be lacking says the lord and the lord is telling us then that we're going to be shepherds and the characteristics of the shepherds we're going to develop i'm looking at amos chapter 3 amos chapter 3 there are sometimes some of the sheep will get into problem into danger what are you going to do at such a time when the sheep get into any danger amos chapter 3 verse 12 thus says the lord as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs and a piece of an ear of an ear so shall the children of israel be taken out that dwell in samaria in the corner of a of a bed and in damascus in a couch uh, uh, sometimes when i read about uh, these shepherds in the bible there's a question i ask myself for example i hear the testimony of david and i was telling Saul, and he said thy servant was watching over the sheep of his father and a lion came and then i went out uh, to that lion and i slew that lion and then the bear came and i went after that bear and i slew the bear and what the lord has done through your servant over the lion over the bear that's what i'm going to do to the philistine and i'm just uh, wondering in my mind that uh, what if that happened today what will i have done then i realized number one i am not given the ministry to protect the normal ordinary sheep therefore the lord is not going to give me the boldness and the courage and the ability and the skill to be able to destroy the literal lion number one you need to determine what the lord has called you to do the lord is not going to give you the ability or the skill or the wisdom to do what he has not called you to do now david was called to watch over the sheep and then a lion came the question still remains in my mind how was he able to do what he did well the lord had said originally I will put the fear of man in the minds and the hearts of those animals and when you come to a leadership position and you come to the position of a shepherd there are some uh, there are some promises of god that are hidden away or covered up that many many people are not looking at anymore but when you come to that shepherd position then the lord said now remember this promise i'm going to put your fear in the minds of those lions because this is what i've called you to that makes me not to relax because i know there are some promises that are specially given to me when i rise up to be the shepherd that i ought to be the reason i'm saying that is because when i read this amos and it says the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or even a piece of ear it's like uh, the lion comes as the lion comes he comes into the fold and he grabs a, a, a sheep or a lamb by the legs and uh, the average shepherd not looking at the promise of promises of god will flee and then the lion will realize the man fears me and this is bigger meat than the sheep i'm holding and if he's running away from me i think i better charge after him and he can the lion will be able to run faster than the man and the man will lose his life but the shepherds of israel they were watching over their flock this is my ministry i have no other thing doing and the promises of god are for me and because i am staying in my ministry just doing what he has called me to do the promises that other people cannot claim because it doesn't they don't belong to them i can claim he'll put my fear in the mind of that lion and then you act as if you are not afraid of the lion and the lion is coming and he charges into your flock 
and grabs one of the sheep with the, in the legs. And then you go right there, and uh, it, because you know the Lord has given you the wisdom and the skill and the ability, and you take the leg out of his mouth. And then if you can kill that lamb, you kill the lamb. If not, you say, find your way. And that lamb is going to respond. And he's going to flee away in Jesus' name. That means you accept your responsibility. And that means you are staying there as the shepherd. And the Lord is going to effect that your life in Jesus' name. Before I move on, how do I describe a shepherd? I just say a shepherd is fast. F-A-S-T. I don't mean fast in the natural. I mean fast, F, focused and faithful. Focused and faithful. You see, when you are focused on your ministry, this is what he has called me to do. And I'm going to feel this ministry he has called me into. I'm going to feel it full. I'm going to fulfill it. Because of that, I focus on it. And because of that, I'm faithful to it. If you're a youth leader, you're not running after another ministry. You're not running after another thing. And you're not eyeing or pursuing another thing in the church. Here is my ministry, I focus on it. If you are children church leader, you are not running at another ministry. Here is my responsibility. Here is what the Lord has called me to do. Focus and faithfulness. And if you are working with the women, that's your focus. That's your faithfulness. You are working with the whole church and you are to show them the things they ought to do. You are in prayers and you are planning and you are focused and faithful. A, available and approachable. Those are leaders. And that's who a shepherd is. A shepherd is available. It brings us back again to that involvement and interaction. You must be available as well as approachable. Approachable. A shepherd is different from the captain of an army. Be approachable. And then as strong and self-sacrificing. That's who a shepherd is. In taking care of the sheep, in beating back the lions, in protecting the fold and the flock, strong and self-sacrificing, tea, tender and tolerant. A shepherd will be tender and tolerant. Did you remember? Do you remember what I told you at the beginning? You are not just writing the things you are hearing. You are writing some of the things you are not hearing from me. You are hearing from the Spirit of God. You are hearing from your own conscience. Are you focused? You are hearing the response from your, whole, from your own conscience. Are you faithful to the flock? Or do you leave your flock and you run here and run there and run to another place? And you help other people to build their ministries. But your own ministry is in shambles. Are you focused? Are you faithful? And then they are inviting you here, they are inviting you there. And there is nothing wrong. The only problem is that those who are inviting you are wiser than you are. They are staying where they are. They are concentrating on their ministry. They are focused and they are faithful. And they need more help because they understand they have given some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And maybe they realize I'm only a pastor. I need a teacher. And therefore they, come, they, run, they say, please can you come? And after you have come, you supply the, uh, the area of teaching. And then they say, I need an evangelist. So and so is an evangelist. Then they say, please evangelist, can you come? And this individual, because he knows I'm just a pastor. He brings in apostles. He brings in prophets. He brings in evangelists. He brings in teachers. And they're building his uh, flock. And uh, you know, as the flock is being built, you know, these people that are coming to build the flock of this uh, wise uh, leader, they are leaving their own flock uncared for. And there's a lot of murmuring, a lot of grumbling. There is division. And they're, they're almost scattering where you are coming from. But you are helping this other person to build his own. Be available. To your own flock and be approachable to your own flock and you know sometimes uh, some of these people we, we invite uh, when they come uh, the, the the members of the church they go to them for counseling and eventually the fellow before he goes away will tell you well uh, i counsel so and so i counsel so and so i think you need to help that individual more this is what he shared with me what I've been in this place for five years, for nine years, and this individual never came to share those things with me. And you are just coming from, you know, I invited you, and they are so free coming to you. 
don't you realize that it's because the fellow is available and is approachable you invited him and he he might not be even be doing that in his own location but he wants to look nice and do well and very very nice and very much available and approachable and he smiles a lot maybe he doesn't smile like that in his own location but he wants to leave a good impression in this place i'm only here for three days of this weekend i'm going to convince them i'm better than their pastor and that's why they were going to him and then eventually now you call your people you say ah what happened brother so and so that i invited told me that you told him this and this and uh, what is it i've been here for nine years you never shared this with me in your life and uh, he says uh, pastor i don't want to say anything negative but if you want me to talk really you know anytime we see you coming to the fellowship the way you march and the way you walk and the way you comport yourself and the way you look around at everybody when you come in eventually we'll just sit on our pews and say hey, don't fool around because pastor will get you we're really afraid of you sir and because we're afraid of you, we couldn't share heart. But you know that man when he came, the way he spoke and the way he greeted us and the way he was very free with us, we just felt that this is a person we should share our hearts with. And uh, Pastor, it's not only me that feels like this, other people feel like that too. And if you're just, you know, the tension and, you know, this rigidity, it will just loosen up and ease up, you'll find out that people be flocking to you like the flies flock to the bees, uh, to, the, to the honey. And so, let's loosen up. Focus on your ministry. Be available. Be strong. And yet, be tender. Be faithful. Be approachable. Be self-sacrificing. And yet, be tolerant. I go to point number two. The concern of the shepherd leader. The concern of the shepherd leader. In John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm reading from the first part of verse 12. John 17. I'm reading from verse 12. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. Those that you have given me, none of them is lost. Obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ himself didn't drive them away. And if he wanted to drive them, he had reason to have driven them. And if the Lord wanted to replace them, he had great, great reason and possibility to have replaced them. Just look at Peter. I think uh, that man should have been, you know, shown the door out. Because uh, the way he was with the master, it's like, uh, who do you think you are? And think about James and John. We might be talking about them later in another message. The sons of thunder and uh, their characteristics and their peculiarities and uh, their demeanor, their, 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 their lifestyle was very different from, the, from that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes the Lord said, you don't know the spirit you are of. The kind of spirit that operates in you, wanting to kill, wanting to destroy, wanting to call down fire. I wasn't called to destroy people, but to save people. If you wanted to drive them away, you could have driven them away. And think about the Lord Jesus Christ. If he got rid of them, he could build other people. Because he is the master and is the maker. And it's not like us. We are kind of incapacitated. You cannot just pick up somebody on the street and build them up. But he could with the miracle working power. And yet he will not use his power. At there times leaders must not use their power? I think so. Are there things, are there times people should not do what they could do if they wanted to? I think so. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ could have abandoned them and he could have justified it and he could have given a good reason for it and he could pick up other people and train other people. Uh, sometimes uh, it looks pathetic and funny that a leader has been raising up people for about 12 years, for about 15 years and then all of a sudden this person you have been raising up for about uh, how many years now? 12, 13, 14 years did something foolish something he shouldn't have done said something foolish something he shouldn't have said and then think about the church this is an individual i have 100 other people that are queuing up and waiting on the line i can easily displace this individual i can get rid of him and choose that other one and i will develop them maybe you could but you shouldn't because jesus could have done that but he didn't 
There are things to do. There are things not to do. You know, some leaders just think that I don't do what I know I cannot do. That's good. But you also should not do some things you could do. Do we get the message? All those people that are there, keep them. You're looking for others, not because you want to displace this one, destroy this one, drive this one away, get everyone in. And that's what Jesus Christ said, I lost none. And it took him time to actually bring Peter to where he needed to bring him. But Jesus was willing to spend the time. You know why? He put value on Peter. Put value on people. Put value on people. Not what they do, not their action, not their weaknesses, not where they are now, but what they could be. Put value on them. And he could have uh, told them, um, Peter, he could have told James and John, you know, when they came, want to sit on this side, want to sit on the other side. And he said, it's not for me to give you. He disappointed them. There are times to disappoint them. But you disappoint them, not giving them what they want, but you don't abandon them. And then the other people, they got, they got uh, angry. And they said, well, how could you do that? You know why they get, got angry? Not because uh, James and John were worse than themselves. You know why? Because they too, they wanted the same thing. And then, because James and John went ahead of them, and I, I should have said that. And Peter was thinking, look at James and look at John. That's my place. They want to go and take. Why didn't it occur to me that I should have gone to Jesus first? That's why they got angry. They were all guilty. But Jesus did not throw them away. And Jesus said, I lost none. Now again, you are going to be writing some things I didn't say. Uh, what didn't I say? There are some people in our ministries. When they needed encouragement, we gave them discouragement. When they needed interaction, we gave them, you know, the backside of our left hand. Get out of there. Go away from there. Who needs you? I have a lot of other people I'm concentrating on. I don't need you. That's the idea we give them. That's the, uh, that, that, that's the message we give them by our action. Uh, that means then you're going to come back as a shepherd. And you're going to be running after those people. Uh, you know, sometimes it's like, um, you know, it's on the women's side sometimes. Uh, the wife of uh, brother so-and-so, this is a great uh, good coordinator, effective coordinator. But the only problem we have with this uh, coordinator is his wife. His wife is not dressing well. His wife is just, it doesn't just, she doesn't fit in. And then what are we going to do? Instead of, uh, you know, seeing how to steal, bring them nearer. Why is the sister doing this? And what's the concept in our mind? We don't care, we want to lose her. Not only lose her, we're even going to lose the effective husband now. And then, um, you know, if you are the methodical type, you may not call the husband because you don't want to say anything that you'll go and tell the wife at home. You just abandon him, put him by the side. And why are you not using brass so and so again? You know, really, I can't tell him this, but I have a problem with the dressing of his wife. What's the problem with the dressing of his wife? Is she using jewelry? Not at all. Does her dressing cover her nakedness? Yes, it does. Does she cover her head when she prays? Yes, she does. It's just that, you know, just, just looking at her, just the air, just the attitude. How do you determine the attitude? How do you evaluate the attitude? You're looking at people with your own colored glass, colored spectacles, remove the glasses, and then put on the eyes of Jesus and the mind of Jesus, and be able to say like Jesus Christ, of all the people that you have given me, I have not lost any. Let me bring out uh, this woman here, Sister, stand here. And this, uh, you know, the sister that our overseer is saying, I'm going to destroy the husband, I'm going to destroy her. And then I bring all these other churches, you know, from this church and this church and this church, and bring them to line up with her. And then you are go still going to see that this woman is way ahead of them in Christian dressing. Still better than the rest of them. How is it that all those other women outside there that are dressing worse than this, our sister here, is accepted? And they are making use of them. 
maybe it's because of you know their own world view they're saying look at their heart don't just look at you know what they have on their body maybe we need to go back home and some of the people we have driven away and we have lost them or we're almost losing them we say well even if something is wrong i'm not justifying what is wrong but i'm going to go beyond what is wrong and i'm going to bring these people together and i'm going to have the interaction i'm going to be available i'm going to be approachable you might even find that you know the sister thinks i'm doing my very best and you'll be surprised if you call the sister very humble and you know teachable and very tender and if you say the sister i've been thinking about something i didn't want to bother you or hurt you i didn't want to talk about this oh pastor don't talk like that you're our father in the lord tell me anything and i'm ready to do anything you want me to do you are surprised the way the woman is responding to you and then you say you know i don't know how to say it but just allow me to say the way i know best your dressing looks different from all these other sisters why is it are you proud pastor just tell me in what way what am i doing and my husband never told me anything and then you say this this and this pastor please pray for me i'm going to do i didn't know all these things you know we are little children you think we're big because we occupy great position in our offices you think that we're so big but i didn't know and then the following week the sister changes everything and then you say ah so this sister has the grace of god like this and he didn't know how would you know if you don't approach them if you don't talk to them if you don't interact with them if you don't ask them questions if you make your conclusions about people and you are not like a real shepherd to be able to share with them and ask them in a polite way things are going to change again we have not failed we're just getting a feedback that some of the methods we have been using they have not worked and they're not helping the ministry we now need to change our strategy in john chapter 10 john chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 16 and other sheep i have which are not of this fold them also i must bring and look at the compulsion here the lord jesus said i have other sheep and they are not of this fold yet i must bring them in he was going to search for them and if you look at luke chapter 15 reading from verse 3 luke chapter 15 verse 3 you are bringing them in you're searching for them you're seeking for them and he spake this parable unto them saying what man of you having an hundred sheep if he lose one does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he finds it uh, can you look up here for a moment again we're going to check up in our own hearts what we normally do he has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray now i want you to picture in your mind i have in that hall there 100 people i have in this hall here 99 people and you come over here on stage on the platform and you look at a hundred people and you look then look at 99 people can you see a difference no you can't see a difference by staying on the ivory tower by remaining on the pulpit you will not see that one was not there that this is 99 that this is 100 you're not going to see much difference between 99 and 100 if you don't come close if you don't interact if you don't investigate if you don't find out if you don't touch the people where they are itching you're still going to think my congregation is still my congregation i still have all my people it is getting nearer that makes you to know that one has been lost another question here we come to church and we even know that now one has been lost and we have 99 here what's my attitude i don't know what's wrong with this fellow at least i'm doing my best and i'm giving the people balanced diet of the word of god if i wasn't doing my best look at these 99 people look at them staying 
and since i've started this ministry all these people that i said that single one that has gone away he has his own problem she has her own problem i'm not going to change my standard or change my method or change my attitude or change my you know approach because of one single solitary person that has gone away that's his own problem if he wants to get to heaven he knows we're preaching the word of god here and he knows that there's sound doctrine here and i'm not going to you know belittle myself and lower myself and then the 99 people are going to think that you know i'm so weak and i'm bothered because of one individual that has gone away no i'm not going to do that i'm a strong leader how many strong leaders are different from the lord jesus christ that they will not go after that single one and then you'll find that here we are and we're shepherds and you have the 90 and nine and then you want to leave the 99 and you want to go to the individual uh, even for those who try to do that how do you do that uh, we call his friend uh, please uh, come do you know brother so and so he's been coming to church and i see he's not coming anymore i'm overhearing that you know they have family problem they've married and there's no child or maybe because uh, this happening to one of his children who doesn't have problem how about all these faithful people that you know all the people here to among these 99 who have not got any child and then he is running away because of not having a child you know people are not thinking about heaven anymore and they're not thinking about the real essentials anymore anyway you're his friend go to him go and visit him and you go and tell him that i heard it's not coming again and tell him to come to come and see me i need to talk to him let's see if we can do our best and and bring him back if those who do that are even they're even trying among us and then his friend goes to him and the friend said uh, run away backslider the pastor remembered you and uh, said you should come he wants to talk to you <laughs> what does he want to talk to me about is it today i left and is it uh, you know it's about three months now since i left he just remembered me today well he said i should call you i should bring you go and tell him i'm sorry i cannot come and his friend came back and said uh, my friend said he's sorry he cannot come leave him alone you know those who are going to perish they never hear the whistle of the hunter he's going to perish but jesus didn't say send his friend to him jesus said you will leave the 90 and 9 and you will go have you ever visited any of your members in their houses are we supposed to do that are we not supposed to keep our dignity and never visit any of the members in their houses are we not going to make the ministry cheap if we begin to visit members in their houses well i about jesus christ he was in the house of mary and martha did he make the ministry cheap he was in the house of simon the leper did he make the ministry cheap and he said you'll leave the ninety and nine and you will go after them you'll not just blow the whistle you'll go after them and you'll be running after them until you find them we're going to do it i said we're going to do it what does the shepherd do number one he does something for people number two he does something to people number three he does something through people number one he does something for people he enlightens them to establish them that's what we do to people you enlighten them and you establish them he does something to people he equips them he empowers them that's what a shepherd does you're doing something for people you're enlightening them you're establishing them you're doing something to people you're equipping them you're empowering them and then you're doing something through people you enlist them and you engage them enlist them and engage them and don't wait until they are perfect before you enlist them and engage them uh, if you remember the leadership style of jesus christ just uh, think about this in your mind now that jesus sent out two by two uh, his disciples two by two to go and preach and heal the sick that is matthew chapter what your preachers matthew chapter chapter 10 okay chapter 10 chapter 10 and then i will go to the cross and die and peter held him 
and said, Lord, that will never happen to you. Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 16. And he brought uh, this uh, fellow to the disciples, and the disciples could not heal them. Matthew chapter 17. And now came James and John and said, Lord, how we want you to grant us our request. One to sit on this side, the other one to sit on this other side. Matthew chapter chapter 20. Ah. We want to wait until there is no possibility of Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 20, before we give the privilege of Matthew chapter 10. We're waiting for the people to be perfect before we can get them involved. I, I talk to some of our leaders and I say, you don't have enough uh, coordinators? No, we don't. And I say, what's the problem? Out of these hundreds and thousands of people in that uh, group, you can't find group, uh, you can't find coordinators and zonal leaders and women reps there. Well, pastor, are, are the people saved? Well, for that, we can tell you they are saved. And they've been in the church for a number of years. They've been in the church for so many years. How is it that we cannot get coordinators and zonal leaders? Then we begin to give reason. And the reason just is basic and simple. We don't want any occurrence of Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 20, before we give the privilege of Matthew chapter 10. Get them involved. And it is as they get involved if they are born again. Then you'll be teaching them and training them. The teaching and the training will not end. Even when you have brought them as coordinators, as zonal leaders, as uh, house fellowship leaders, the training will still continue. Don't wait until you don't need any training anymore before you get them involved. Let them keep on doing the work. And we're going to work together with them and they're going to succeed in Jesus' name. Now again, what are you going to write down? Where are some areas of the section of the work that you as a shepherd, you could have filled them. But a lot of vacancies are there because you have been waiting and you are waiting too long. You write those areas down because after this uh, planning meeting, we're going to go back home and we're going to effect changes in Jesus' name. I come to point number three, the courage of the shepherd leader. The courage of the shepherd leader. We are looking at four Samuel, for Samuel, I'm reading from chapter 17. For Samuel, chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 34 through to verse 36. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth and when he arose against me i caught him by the beard by his beard and smote him and slew him thy servant slew both the lion and the bear this uncircumcised philistine shall be as one of them seeing he has defied the armies of the living god david said moreover the lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of this philistine he will in jesus name uh, the lord is telling us that we need courage and obviously david had courage and we need courage and boldness as we look at um, ephesians chapter ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6 verse 19 and for me that is pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel and this uh, Paul the apostle that was praying that he wanted boldness is it because he was a coward? Not at all. Is it because he had never manifested boldness? Ah, you know Paul the Apostle, he had manifested boldness in more areas than one. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. And it came to pass in, in Icon Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. 
and so spake that a great multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed but the unbelieving Jews touched up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands in verse 3 they were speaking boldly Paul included and yet he said to the Ephesians thank God for the boldness I have yet I need more prayer that I'll continue to be bold as shepherds we need number one the courage to preach the whole truth the courage to preach the whole truth number two the courage to protect the sheep the courage to protect the sheep number three the courage to pursue the goal of mission the mission the ministry that the Lord has given us to accomplish and to fulfill we need the courage to pursue that goal of mission number four the courage to plan with no visible resources that is you know what the Lord wants you to do and you do not see the visible resources yet and the courage to plan even when those resources are not visible because you have God as your resource and you have Christ and through him you can do all things and you have the Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit of God and the wisdom of the Spirit of God is available to you too and the promises of God are there and so you can plan with no visible resources number five the courage to persevere when the going gets tough when the going gets tough the way another person has put it is when the going gets tough the tough gets going when the going gets tough the tough gets going that is things are difficult and things are challenging and yet if you are if you are tough in your mind and tough because you are built up and because you are edified now because you are strong in your mind then you persevere even at such difficult times the courage to persevere number six the courage to pilot the congregation in difficult times when our team breaks out you don't run out of town and when there is epidemic of sickness in that community you don't run out of town and when it appears that there's uh, somebody a Kora or Dathan on Ab or Abiram that is uh, polluting the minds of people and it wants to sway them in the wrong direction you don't run out of town and when somebody said ah look at this uh, leader there's no water to drink and there's no food to eat isn't it better for us to go back into Egypt and he becomes bold enough to stand before the congregation and say don't listen to the preacher to the pastor we're all going back to Egypt and you don't run out of town the courage to keep on piloting the congregation in difficult times number seven the courage to progress in times of danger the courage to progress in times of danger now i want you to understand that all these things are not born with us uh, somebody uh, got to a village and uh, said has any great man ever uh, been born in this uh, village the old man looked at the fellow asking the question and said no he turned the question around again what i mean are doctors engineers great leaders courageous people champions have they ever been born in this village and the old man said i told you no and then he said but has there been at any significant uh, you know personality raised up in this place and the fellow said yes and then this fellow asking the question said but you said no at the beginning oh he said young man great men are not born great men are made when a baby is born you cannot say this is a courageous child no nobody is born with courage nobody is born with compassion 
Nobody is born with the characteristics of a great shepherd, a good shepherd. They are developed. And here we are. And if we know we are not there, we just don't say, I was not born like that. Nobody was ever born like that. And as we go on in the leadership series, you are going to discover, it is not what you are born with. It is when you come to the Lord and then you say, Lord, make a great shepherd, make a good shepherd, make a gracious shepherd out of me. That has the characteristics of a good shepherd, that has also the uh, concern of a good shepherd, and has the courage of a good shepherd and the Lord is going to do it I said the Lord is going to do it we are going to rise up now our prayer will not be like we used to pray our prayer will not be like you know you just hear a message and then you just pray you will think through everything that you have had some of the individuals where have run off from the ministry you mentioned them by name Lord give me the humility and give me the courage I am going to run after them I am going to reach out to them and the Lord is going to help us the ministry the Lord has called you to a uh, fulfill that you say oh Lord on this area I'm getting a feedback I've not succeeded but the feedback is making me to develop a new set of strategies and then a new set of uh, plans of action so that I'll be able to now do what I need to do practical practical things you'll tell the Lord you'll make some decisions the Lord will help you in Jesus name you know the way show the way and go the way along with your people be fast that means focused and faithful be available to your flock be approachable the first time you get near the flock if you have been far away they will be afraid of you they even try to avoid you they will give you signal go back to your office Go back to the pulpit. You don't belong here. You never interact with us. Your presence makes us afraid. Don't worry about that. That's the first signal you are going to get. Because you've not been doing that before. Persevere. Go with love. Go with grace. Be strong enough. Not to run away. Because of a little pebble that is being thrown at you. Be self-sacrificing enough that you don't care. Even if some of your people unintentionally hurt you. Don't run away from hurt. And be tender and be tolerant. Don't comment about everything that looks negative. Don't fight everything that seems to go against you. There are some fights not worth getting involved in. When those things are non-essentials, they are insignificant. Just overlook them. Be a shepherd, be a father, be a mother. Move on. Be tender, teachable, tolerant. Be courageous. Courage to preach. Don't worry about the reaction or the response or the result. The courage to preach seemingly difficult subjects. The courage to preach the whole truth to seemingly irresponsive congregation. And the courage to protect the sheep. What dangers have you seen as possibilities on your congregation? Are you are the shepherd there. The courage to protect the sheep. Maybe you are not born with courage. Nobody is. Get nearer to the Lord. Tell him to give you all the grace you need. And he will give you the courage you need. The courage to pursue the goal. Don't you have a goal, a mission, a dream? A destination. What are you deciding to achieve in ministry? What's the plan of action? You failed before. That's just a feedback. Change the strategy. Become flexible. Develop a new set of plans of action. 
the courage to plan without visible resources not enough money not enough people not enough facilities not enough visible tangible materials keep on planning plan of the promises of God in mind the courage to persevere when the going gets tough don't be afraid of challenges keep going and the courage to stay with your congregation in difficult times pilot them the courage to keep on making progress in times of danger in Jesus name we pray Heavenly Father, we thank you at this time. Thank you because of the things you brought into our attention. Thank you because of your calling upon our lives. You have called us to be leaders, shepherds. Father, we pray that all these good characteristics you have reminded us of will be developed in us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, you grant us concern for your sheep. And concern for those who are not in the fold yet that we need to bring to the fold. Help us, Lord, to live and to minister, to please you, and to do what you have called us to do. Help us, Lord, to have the courage of a real shepherd, a called leader. Effect it in our lives, O Lord, that after this planning meeting, our leadership style will change in Jesus' name. Let this work prosper in our hands. In Jesus' name we pray.